me talk to you about LDL cholesterol yeah. real quick? Because <laughs> there's this common misconception. I have a family member who recently was diagnosed with high LDL. And the first thing the doctor went to is we need to put you on a statin in perpetuity. Right. And when I look at her, yes, she's up there in age, uh, late 60s, early 70s, but has the health of an average probably 45 or 50 year mm. old, but just sees this one marker on a test. And we now think that she should be on statins. So can we talk about is LDL, high LDL cholesterol bad? And also, are statins problematic in any way? And is, what are statins and what is LDL? Right, right, right. <laughs> this is a super important question. I'll do my best to make it palatable, but it's not going to be in 60 seconds. So that clock, we, we, we don't even <laughs> Just throw out the clock. <laughs> we don't even need the clock. Mm -hmm. um, so LDL cholesterol is low density lipoprotein. It's a balloon, it's a, it's a spherical molecule in your body that has a single lipid monolayer and it carries cholesterol and triglycerides. It's essentially like a bus that moves from your liver, the bus station to other tissues of your body and supplies them with building blocks. So now we've already seen that the LDL has a functional positive role in the human body. Those building blocks being cholesterol and triglycerides. Cholesterol, yes, is a valuable nutrient in your body. It's the backbone of your steroid hormones. So mm. all progesterone, estrogen, pregnenolone, uh, testosterone is built from a cholesterol backbone. Is it a steroid backbone? It travels on an LDL bus to tissues of your body. Now there's buses that go back an LDL can go back or HDL buses can usually go back to the liver. This is obviously an oversimplification. There's lots of buses that move around your body on bus routes. And so the LDL is carrying passengers. They get off at certain stops. Other passengers can get on and move back to the liver, generally speaking. Now, in, in, in the LDL particle, there are these other molecules, triglycerides and cholesterol. But we think of cholesterol is a misnomer because cholesterol is the steroid molecule, but LDL is a type of cholesterol. But LDL is not cholesterol in any way, shape, or form. It's just a bus that carries a cholesterol molecule. So LDL canonically has been thought of as bad, but let's reframe it. Let's just back up and think, um, why would a molecule that is essential for human life be bad for us? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and we know there are genetic syndromes where you don't make enough cholesterol because of en enzymatic genetic defects in the cholesterol synthesis pathway. The liver makes a lot of cholesterol. You eat cholesterol and the liver makes cholesterol and the liver exports it on the bus to other parts of the body. But there's a condition called smith lemley oppitt syndrome where one of the enzymes in the synthesis of cholesterol in the body is broken and you don't make a lot of cholesterol. These kids have depression, they have sleep issues, a lot of them die in utero, and they have massive susceptibility to infections, and they're given egg yolks as a therapy for their disease. So they're mm. given basically a bag of cholesterol, which is an egg yolk, to treat their disease. Mm. We know that in animal models, if you deplete an animal, a rat or a mice, uh, a mouse of cholesterol, of LDL cholesterol, they're more susceptible to infections. If you give a rat or a mouse more LDL cholesterol, they have more resilience to infectious insults. We know that in humans, and this has been studied at many different levels, those humans with higher levels of LDL tend to uh, resist infections and have less hospital admissions. And in the elderly, in elderly cohorts, 75 and above, I believe, those with the highest levels of LDL live the longest and have the most longevity. So there's a real conundrum here in our minds when 99% perhaps of doctors would tell you that LDL is bad. How can this be? And I think it's because the LDL molecule gets associated with increased levels of heart disease so often in, in tests in humans, whether these are observational epidemiology studies. And we say those people, in some people, as the level of LDL rises in the body, we see an increase in cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease being this process of atherosclerosis, right? The formation of a plaque in the arterial wall. So atherosclerosis, heart disease, is in the arterial wall. You have an artery, and if you cut that artery in this direction and you're looking down the center of the pipe, the, the wall of the artery is where all the action happens for atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis. And there are levels of cells in the arterial wall. There's an endothelium, which is the inside. There's an intima, there's a media. And so subintimally between the intima and the media is generally where the atherosclerotic plaque happens. And in people who have higher levels of cholesterol at a very basic high level, you may see an association between more LDL in the blood, higher levels of heart disease. But if you look deeper, it gets really interesting because in many population studies, 
uh, N. Haynes, which is a population or Framingham study, if you break that relationship down, and I almost need a whiteboard to explain this, but you let's look at a relationship. On the x-axis, you have the, the amount of LDL cholesterol in the human body, and say it's running from 100 to 150 to 200 milligrams per deciliter, and then above 200. And on the y-axis, you have incidence of cardiovascular disease, the percentage of people or the relative risk of developing a heart attack or the precursors, meaning this atherosclerosis in the vessel wall. If you look at the Framingham data overall, as you go up, it's a, it's a straight line that kind of goes up to the right, meaning the more cholesterol, the more heart disease. But if you break the cohort down by a third variable, and that variable gives you some indication of your metabolic health or your insulin sensitivity, a very different pattern emerges. And you get four lines based on the metric that I've seen used is HDL cholesterol. So HDL is canonically thought of as good cholesterol, but it's much more complicated than that. Mm. But in this case, HDL is a good proxy for insulin sensitivity because generally people who are more insulin resistant, which is synonymous with prediabetes and diabetes, have lower HDL. Diabetics tend to waste HDL. It's just human physiology that a pre-diabetic or diabetic state results in higher triglycerides and lower HDL. Mm. So if you, su if you subfractionate the total cohort of the Framingham study by HDL, you get four lines, right? HDL less than 25 or 25 or less, HDL 25 to 50, HDL 50 to 75, or HDL above 75. You can choose whatever cutoffs you want. And the people with the highest HDL, there's essentially, these are people who are going to have generally insulin sensitivity. They're going to be metabolically healthy, right? People with the lowest HDL, most likely to be diabetic, pre-diabetic, insulin resistant. Okay? Follow me so far? Yep. The people with the highest HDL in the Framingham cohort have basically a straight line that's flat. <laughs> they don't have any connection between the amount of LDL in their body and the incidence of coronary heart disease. Oh, wow. Mm. The people with, or like a very, very small upslope, very small. Okay. People with the lowest HDL looks like this, meaning that the more higher your LDL, the more heart disease you have. And there are multiple studies that show this. In humans who have high HDL and low triglycerides, which is a clear marker of insulin sensitivity and metabolic health, there is very little, if any, relationship between the amount of LDL in your blood and the incidence of cardiovascular disease. But in both instances, that LDL bus is going to be consistently traveling. It's always traveling. And so that's what makes us say it's correlated with that. It, the LDL is always there. Yeah. But what we see is that when you, if you, if you stratify studies by insulin sensitivity, we know that the single greatest risk factor, I would argue, for determining whether your LDL is going to be connected with heart disease is your insulin sensitivity. But mm. most, most people don't understand that. Mm. So when your, uh, when your family member had her cholesterol checked, mm -hmm. I'm willing to bet a very nice, delicious ribeye steak that they did not <laughs> check a fasting insulin. Mm. They, they probably did zero metrics to look at her fasting insulin or her metabolic health. So we know very clearly in medicine that your metabolic health is the context by which we should evaluate the risk of your LDL load. But doctors don't do that. So we're, we're flying blind. We're only using half the variables mm. that we should be using. There's no contextualizing because Western medicine isn't good at contextual uh, nuance at all. We just want to say, you have high LDL. We know that in a population, if we give you a statin, and I'll talk about statins in a moment, we will slightly reduce your risk, especially if you've had a heart attack. If you haven't had a heart attack, there's not a lot of great data for statins in primary prevention. But so there, Western medicine is not good at individualizing care for humans. They're they're okay at looking at a population swath, but for anyone who's listening to this podcast or thinking about these things with nuance or making intentional decisions with regard to their food and lifestyle, Western medicine is not really going to serve you with the level of in, like clarity and like specificity that you really need. And so they're not even going to check what her insulin sensitivity is. They're not going to say, you're metabolically healthy. And if we look at the data, someone who's metabolically healthy with your level of LDL actually doesn't have an increased risk of heart disease. So why would we give you a statin, which we know interrupts the synthesis of cholesterol in the human body and has tons of side effects? Because mm. when we're interrupting the synthesis of cholesterol, we're also interrupting the synthesis of coenzyme Q10, which is a key part of an electron transport chain, which is how all the energy in the body gets processed and translated into useful currencies, ATP and things like that. So many people who take statins get muscle aches because they get, because they we've we've abrogated, we've basically stopped their production of critical nutrients that are in the same pathway as cholesterol. Mm. And so Western medicine says, oh, it's okay, we'll just give you more coenzyme Q10. Well, what about the squalene or these other you know, nutrients that the human body is making in the cholesterol pathway? We're not supplementing all of those. And how bioavailable is this coenzyme Q10 that they're giving you? And if a doctor gives you co coenzyme Q10 when you have muscle aches on a statin, that's a very astute physician in the first place. Most of them will just say, stay on the statin. The most important thing is that I don't get sued 
for you getting a heart attack with this LDL. Mm. So it's a very complex situation, but let's just back up again and, and, and really kind of summarize what we're dealing with here. Here's the question that I would ask, because there are a lot of really well-intentioned, super smart people in the space who believe that something called ApoB, which is a lipoprotein that identifies, that sits on LDL, another bus called VLDL, another bus called chylomicrons. So they say ApoB-containing particles are atherogenic. They create atherosclerosis. Mm. That doesn't make sense to me that a particle that exists in the human body um, that carries this apolipoprotein would inherently be damaging to the endothelium, the inside of our blood vessels, and initiate atherosclerosis. And so the question I always ask these people is, if LDL, if ApoB-containing lipoproteins like LDL are atherosclerotic, meaning they have the ability to generate atherosclerosis on their own by damaging the inside of the blood vessel, then why don't we get atherosclerosis in veins? Hmm. And why is it only in arteries? So when you when when the blood goes out of your heart, into your tissues, that's in arteries. When it returns from your tissues to your heart, that's in veins. You can see veins on the surface of my skin. They're blue. You can't see the arteries. They're deeper. A so lot the, of track marks there. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the veins are coming back, right? We never see atherosclerosis in veins in humans, only arteries. And why is that? Because the same amount of LDL cholesterol is circulating in my veins as in my arteries. It's a contiguous system. There are capillaries here. The blood gets pumped out of my heart to my brain and arteries, to my legs and arteries, all over my body. It's in arteries. And then it goes to capillaries and it switches and it comes back around, makes a U-turn and comes back to my heart. That's how it works. So veins don't develop, don't develop atherosclerosis, only arteries. Why is that? If ApoB is initiating atherosclerosis, it doesn't make any sense to me. And the answer is that in arteries, you have higher pressure. You know, average blood pressure is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury because arteries are more muscular. They have a, a, an outer layer, a muscularis layer that is much bigger than a vein. But the inner part, the endothelium is exactly the same. So arteries are much more muscular because they must carry more pressure mm. to push the blood, which means that when there's more pressure, there's more denuding of the endothelium, which means there's more damage just by being an artery because the pressure in there is higher. So my argument is ApoB containing particles like LDL are not atherosclerotic. You need endothelial damage to initiate atherosclerosis. And then if ApoB particles get wrapped into that, perhaps as part of the repair process, it could make it look like they're make it look like they're guilty, right? Are they the firemen or are they the arsonist? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're arriving to the scene of the damage in the artery that is happening because of mm -hmm. high pressure as part of the healing process. And there's more of them in people who have more susceptibility to damage in their arteries, like diabetics. Mm -hmm. We know that people who are insulin resistant or back to that term, insulin resistant, they have more, they have impaired wound healing. We hear about this all the time in diabetics. You get an uh, amputated toe or a leg or a foot. Yeah. They have very impaired wound healing. And we know that in the artery, at the level of the endothelium, just by living, a diabetic is damaging their endothelium, just like you and I are damaging the endothelium of our arteries by having pressure. But neither you or I are diabetic. Neither you or I are insulin resistant. So our body has the ability to repair those things properly, to go in with immune cells and repair the endothelium. But a diabetic, someone that's insulin resistant, is going to have impaired wound healing, and that leaves more holes in the facade where there is damage, where the LDL particles are being called, and there's an immune impairment in the process of repair, and that is what causes atherosclerosis. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That so was if a someone, lot. If someone is metabolically damaged, and they have decreased insulin sensitivity. Is that repairable? It's absolutely reversible mm. by changing the diet. And wow. so just to summarize here with respect to LDL cholesterol, wow. Dr. Paul Saladino is not that worried about LDL cholesterol. Some doctors are worried because they're afraid of being sued. And so then they recommend statins, which might be worrisome for many people because of the side effects. And speaking of not being sued, I should remark that Nothing on this podcast is medical advice. <laughs> and so please consult your doctor, your astrologist, your pet care uh, facilities, and uh, <laughs> your yoga instructor before yes. implementing anything into your life. Don't take responsibility for yourself. Please outsource it to everyone in your community because you're not responsible. Everyone else is responsible for your health. Oh, my goodness. The one thing I'll just add to your summary is I don't worry about LDL if someone is insulin sensitive. In a diabetic, do I worry about LDL? Yeah, but fix the insulin sensitivity, right? Mm. I'm not, the, the LDL, I think there's, there's a lot of good evidence that we really need to have these 
these discussions uh, among physicians and, and question the dogma with regard to LDL. I think just knee-jerk responses saying your LDL is high, you need a statin is, is not the whole picture. You have mm-hmm. to understand the context of that. Mm-hmm. And then we need to equip physicians with education that tells them this is how you help your patients reverse their insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And we need to do research that actually creates some substance behind that recommendation. So real quick, because someone who goes to their doctor and their doctor says, hey, you have high LDL, and they panic right away, Mm -hmm. right? And they're like, oh, they want me to get on a drug. And I can't possibly repeat everything (laughs) that Dr. Saladino just said. (laughs) And so I just throw up my hands. What is one or two sentences they can say to their doctor to say, I'm not that concerned about my high LDL because I'm not diabetic. Did you check a fasting insulin? Can we can we evaluate my metabolic health? Mm. And if you just say, can we evaluate my metabolic health? The doctor will not know how to evaluate the metabolic health. Um. So you may need to ask them to check a fasting insulin. And the, the last piece I'll add to this <clears throat> is that it's very clear in human physiology that in many humans, eating more saturated fat and less polyunsaturated fat raises the LDL slightly, right, right. slightly, 10%, 20%, which is why a lot of people eating in this way will go to their doctor and have a, quote, high LDL. The last time I checked my LDL, it was 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is just above the normal range, saying 120. But most doctors would say, you have a high LDL, you should mm-hmm. eat less red meat. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, eating less red meat will lower my LDL. And I could even lower my LDL more by eating canola oil. But what do we know? And what are the doctors missing? Something I've hinted at a couple times in the podcast, that if you go a level deeper and you look at the predictors of cardiovascular disease, in general, LDL is pretty poor, like we talked about. What's a really good predictor? Oxidized LDL. So you're taking the phospholipids on the outside of that LDL molecule and assaying how many of them have been oxidized. And we know that oxidized LDL goes up when you eat polyunsaturated fats, even though your total LDL goes down because you're populating more of the outside of that LDL molecule with fragile fats, these polyunsaturated fatty acids. Mm. So ox LDL goes up. LP little a, which is another metric of LDL oxidation because it's a particle that kind of scavenges oxidized phospholipids, goes up when you eat polyunsaturated fatty acids, but your LDL goes down. So most physicians are just looking surface at LDL, but Mm -hmm. really we should be looking at oxidized LDL and LP little a. And remember that just because eating saturated fat makes your LDL go up, your oxidized LDL and your LP little a go down. It probably has to do with something, this word is technical, so I apologize in advance, called the homeoviscous model of membrane fluidity. And the, the high level is that when you eat more saturated fats, we know that the fats we eat become a part of our cell membranes and cells are very delicate <clears throat> and very specific about how they want to maintain membrane fluidity. And because you're eating more saturated fats, cells are probably going to raise the cholesterol in your bed, in, in your blood to keep the membrane fluidity at a, at a baseline level. So more saturated fats in the body will, in the diet, will create an uh, increase in blood cholesterol because your body's trying to maintain fluidity of the cell membrane. More polyunsaturated fats will probably lower the blood cholesterol because your body is trying to maintain fluidity of the membrane. But again, it's not, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's not pathological that when you're eating more saturated fat, the LDL is going up. It's your mm. body just trying to keep homeostasis. Yeah, that wow. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Did you enjoy this standalone Patreon highlight? If so, you can listen to full episodes of the Minimalist Private Podcast, available exclusively on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash the minimalists or click the link in the description. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free.